Okay, I've got, uh, I've got 8.30, so since we have such a, a busy uh, two days planned, I think I'll try to kick it off uh, according to, to the schedule published. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 21st annual McCain Conference. I think like everyone else on the planet, uh, our plans were disrupted the last two years due to COVID, and we're extremely excited uh, to get back to a primary purpose of this conference, which is to bring everybody together um, practitioners and academics alike focused on a matter of, of critical importance to the military ethics community. Uh, that we're able to do this uh, in this truly spectacular uh, new Naval Institute facility. Uh, it still has that new car smell. That's an absolute uh, bonus for us. And speaking of that larger community, I want to start by recognizing a few people uh, from the Stockdale Center team who have done an incredible amount of work uh, to pull this whole thing together. Uh, we'll thank them at multiple points, but I want to even start uh, by thanking them. Our, our Director of Research, uh, Dr. Ed Barrett, and our Distinguished Chair in Ethics, Dr. David Luban, they worked uh, very closely with our resident research fellows to build a foundation for everything you'll see uh, over the, the course of the next two days. Uh, as most know, this, is, this conference is Ed's baby, uh, so much so that he's sleeping on site uh, here last night and tonight uh, to ensure that uh, all the details are covered for this thing. Uh, but when it comes to details, uh, there's no one member of the, the Stockdale Center team that uh, covers details quite the way Ms. Karen Ornberg does. She's our uh, events manager, and anything that goes well uh, over the course of the next two days, which is pretty much everything, uh, it's attributable primarily to, to Ms. Ornberg, our events manager. Uh, no one works harder than Karen on all this, and we're really grateful for the work that she's put into all this. Now, this year we have special uh, partners in our efforts, Drs. Henrik Seiss and Greg Reichenberg from the Peace Institute, Institute uh, Research Institute of Oslo, or PRIO, uh, whose mission it is to conduct research on the peaceful relations between states, groups, and people. And, and they've partnered with us to expand the network uh, of those touched by this particular event and conference. They've uh, attended our seminars this year and have helped organize post-conference publications. Uh, most of all, we're interested in learning more about their grant project, Warring with Machines, Military Applications of Artificial Intelligence and the Relevance of Virtue Ethics, and there'll be a lot more on that tomorrow morning. Now, our topic this year, obviously, is the ethics of military AI, but what uh, does that really mean? Uh, experimental psychologists estimate that processing speed of, of the human conscious brain, at least, is somewhere around 120 bits per second. Now, for reference, to understand one person speaking to us requires about 60 bits per, uh, per second. Our conscious mind, or attention, has clear limits. Uh, the Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee can process 200 quadrillion, and that's 200 with 15 zeros, calculations per second, or 200 petaflops, as they're called. Now, for comparative purposes, our friends at Oak Ridge National Lab claim that if every person on Earth completed one calculation per second, it would take the world population 305 days to do what their one computer can do in one second. And by the way, the Frontier supercomputer, which is currently being brought online at Oak Ridge, is much, much faster than Summit processing 200 quintillion calculations per second, 200 with 18 zeros behind it. It's difficult for our mind to grasp the meaning of such processing speed. So in light of the potential of such computer technology to enhance decision making, I believe the expertise partnered here and gathered with us for this next two days can help us think about three fundamental questions I'd like to pose to you to think about uh, across the span of this conference. Number one, where, or perhaps how, is AI most helpful to decision makers in a military context? Two, what are the limitations of AI in this context? And three, what are the moral or ethical pitfalls associated with the use of AI in a military conflict, uh, context? Three valid, uh, very, very challenging questions for sure, but as I look around the room, uh, here today, I believe we have just the right people to engage in the best thinking on this subject. With that, I'd like to invite our 
Superintendent, Vice Admiral Sean Buck, 63rd Superintendent of the Naval Academy, to welcome you and share his thoughts on this really important topic. Admiral Buck. So let me add one caveat to what Joe just shared with us. That thinking of the human conscious mind is improved if you've had coffee. <laughs> we, we might up that a little bit, right? Joe, thank you very much for the introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thanks for letting me join you. Where is Lieutenant General Grone? Where have you sat, General? Are you in the audience? Right or oh, you're behind me. Check your six, right, Admiral? Well, General Grone, back there in the shadows, good morning. Distinguished guests and visitors, alumni, midshipmen, I see that we've kind of separated ourselves into our respective pods. Uh, I'm glad you're able to break free from some of your classes and give us your free time to come listen and contribute. The key word will be to contribute to this discussion that Dr. Thomas just talked about. And I'd like to add my thanks to everyone, every single person in the Stockdale Center that worked so tirelessly to, to make this what it's going to be over the course of the next two days, a really, really important topic. I'd also like to say that I'm heartened and I'm amazed to welcome all of you all in person. Uh, and in person to this beautiful Jack C. Taylor Conference Center, I myself, last time well, this didn't exist. This elevated uh, stage did not exist. Last time I was kind of where, in the area where your seats are, it was dirt. Uh, it was dusty. It was noisy. It was a heck of a construction zone. And I, I am amazed. Uh, I, I wanted to use the word I'm amazed at how nice it has turned out. Is there anybody in the room this morning from the Naval Institute right, right this moment? Well, if you'd pass on our collective thanks uh, to Vice Admiral Daly and to all of you all who have opened this up and allowed the Naval Academy and all of these practitioners and academics to come and have a conference in your center. Thank you very much. It's gorgeous. So I've, some of the, my Naval Academy family team have heard me say this uh, before, and I enjoy saying it to, to new members of guests at our conferences here. But it is worth repeating, the Naval Academy, your Naval Academy, is at its best when we're able to leverage our beautiful location here in Annapolis, Maryland, and our incredible talent and resources that reside here and work here at the Naval Academy. For instance, the Stockdale Center. We're able to bring together academics and practitioners from across the nation and the world to engage in important conversations uh, and, and debates on really, really critical topics. Here at the Naval Academy, if you don't know, uh, the study of ethics is central to the development of leaders of character that we're going to produce to serve in our Navy and our Marine Corps. The Vice Admiral James B. Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, since its inception, has been the absolute crown jewel of our initiatives to further the study of ethics and to help forge a deeper understanding of ethical leadership within everyone who lives, works, studies, and thrives here in Annapolis. The McCain Conference is one of those initiatives of the Stockdale Center that I'm always incredibly proud to be a part of. And yes, we're back in person now. What you all mentioned to me, we haven't done this in person since 19. Is that correct? Yeah, it's good to be back, and I'm proud to be a part of it. The McCain uh, Conference is always a special event because it brings together those of us in the profession of arms, whether you're wearing a uniform or whether you're a civilian member of the profession of arms, as well as those who instruct and develop and work alongside all of us that are in the profession of arms. And we get to discuss and debate matters of critical ethical importance to all of us so that we ensure that we get it right when we have to leverage such capabilities as artificial intelligence. This conference, the, and particularly the topic that was chosen for the conference this year, highlights the groundbreaking work that our team at the Stocktail Center is doing on a daily basis, and the thought leadership that they're developing in the field of ethics for those of us that serve in the profession of arms. 
Our theme raises important ethical questions about an emerging technology that must be vigorously examined and debated, not only amongst philosophers, but also the academics and the engineers that are developing artificial intelligence technologies for our militaries and the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen and marines that will actually employ that technology. Reliance on artificial intelligence across all sectors and industries raises complex ethical and legal questions regarding automation bias and accountability for harm. And while military applications for artificial intelligence have the potential to enhance mission effectiveness and reduce casualties on the battlefield through assistance with planning, intelligence, and logistics, and even strikes, these technologies largely remain untested. That's kind of scary thought for now. That's why we all need to continue to think and talk about it. The use of AI for military operations also raises complex questions with regards to a nation's adherence to use in Bellin imperatives. The McCain Conference once again serves as a unique venue to bring together the diverse and the multidisciplinary perspectives that I know are in this audience that are needed to have fruitful informed debates and discussions on this topic. It's exciting work that we're all doing. Sometimes it's scary work. Sometimes it's complex and and uh, confounding to even think through. I was trying to envision, Joe, when you were saying a number with the number of zeros to the right, I was trying to comprehend really what you were mentioning and, and what that processing could do for all of us to, to help think and do better. I, uh, I just want to say thanks for taking your time to, to come and, and to be a part of it and to continue the work that you have been doing and that you need to do, we all need to do moving in the future. So enjoy the next couple of days. Um, I'm going to be in and out, trying to take in as much of it as I can, while I also serve in my role as soup and, and uh, represent the Naval Academy to many various audiences that are here in the yard in Annapolis this spring. Take care. Thank you. Well, thanks again, sir, for the kind words and the excellent way to kind of kick these things uh, off here across the next couple of days, and I think you've captured uh, the challenges that are presented by, uh, uh, by what we're about to talk about. The challenges are pretty considerable in all this. Um, as as uh, Admiral Buck mentioned, we've got, um, we've got practitioners and academics um, lined up for, uh, for the next couple of days, and if you look at that schedule close, you'll see that day one, um, is a day that we're going to use to get the perspective of practitioners uh, who are actually in this fight, engaged in the fight um, uh, regarding artificial intelligence, the use of technology, the harnessing of technology. And there's really no better person to start uh, this conversation, to kick this whole thing off, than Lieutenant General Michael S. Grone. Uh, General Grone assumed his current position as the director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center on October 1st, 2020. And before his current role, he served as a director of intelligence on the joint staff, the J-2, and prior to that, as a director of Marine Corps intelligence. General Groen has commanded intelligence and operational units, including the 3rd Radio Battalion, conducting its first deployment to the southern Philippines in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, and the Headquarters Battalion of 1st Marine Division in Camp Pendleton, California. He served as the initial director of the Commandant's Amphibious Capabilities Working Group, the Ellis Group on Expeditionary Futures, and as a director of the Commandant of the Marine Corps Strategic Initiatives Group, or SIG. General Grone possesses a master's degree from the University of Southern California, Systems and, uh, Management, and from the Naval Postgraduate School in Electrical Engineering and Applied Physics. And he's a graduate of the Marine Corps Command Staff College, as well as the Naval War College. General Grone, welcome and thanks again for joining us. Great. Well, hey, th thanks everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk with you this morning on a really important uh, it's a really important conversation. And I think just uh, you, you know, uh, as listening to uh, Emerald Buck in the, in the introduction, you know, it's it's clear to me that we have to think about a couple of things. I, I think that there are three things that are really baseline for us. That is legal imperatives, moral imperatives, and comparatives. So today we put young men and women in harm's way. We have stacks of people at a door, kicking a door in and being the first one through the door, right? We, we, we entrust decisions to 
tired watchstanders that have maybe been up for days, or humans you know, who maybe avert their eyes from a screen just long enough for a threat to go unnoticed. The comparatives are what we hope to solve with artificial intelligence, to help our operators, to help our warfighters, to help everybody who supports that chain to, to use data for the ability to actually make better decisions, make better decisions, make better scoped decisions, and make them much faster. The, uh, the, the, the possibilities in front of us are, are enormous. Let me grab my clicker here. There it is. Um, but I'm going to start, so we're going to talk about AI and robots and all the rest. But let me start here. These are, maybe so, these are Lancers, right? And Lancers are, Lancers are men on horseback with a wooden stick with an iron spike on the end, right? And Lancers are proud, right? They have a culture. They have a history. They have an ethic that they're very comfortable with, right? Man on horse, you know, fighting another man on horse. Goes back to the Middle Ages, right? So, so like that deep ethic, everything that they value. Um, you know, at the, o, the Lancer O Club, you know, they got their, their mugs, you know, with their call sign on it and everything else, right? Um, their daddies were Lancers. Their granddaddies were Lancers. Um, powerful imagery. Powerful uh, culture. Powerful capability. Any guess when this picture was taken? 1913, what happens in 1914, right? The guns of August and these Lancers, I mean, if you go, you know, during COVID, I spent some time watching like, you know, colorized like World War I documentaries. Maybe some of you did the same. Um, and you, no kidding, you, you saw like formations of Lancers charging into machine guns, charging into massed indirect fire, charging into poison gas, obstacles, barriers, you know, the, the industrial age fortifications. H how could this be, right? Uh, how could they have missed this entire transformation of the character of warfare? And all of their ethics that also had to change in a changed character, characterization of warfare. This is a powerful image for me. I, I ran across this picture years ago, and I, like, I, I have it on the wall in my office. I mean, this is our watch. This is our warning, right? We have to continually think about our ethical baselines, our military capabilities, and aligning capabilities and our ethical constructs to the fight that we actually anticipate fighting. This is a, this is a significant responsibility for every leader wearing a uniform uh, or who has worn, worn a uniform. So let me... Uh, can you go one more, please? I'll just, I'll just say next, and we won't worry about this little device here. Um, so, so where are we in the, uh, in the evolution of artificial intelligence, right? So um, I always think about artificial intelligence in terms of competition, right? Like the, what, what keeps me awake at night is the question, are we competitive with our opponents or are we not? And uh, I think it's, it's, it's critical when you think about, um, you know, a uh, growing $16 trillion uh, e economic bump, right, in global economic activity associated with artificial intelligence implementation through like 2030. And clearly, like all of the industries around us, the ones that still survive, still survive because they've made that jump into artificial intelligence-driven operations that don't make decisions for people, but help people make decisions by building the information environment that makes it possible to understand, to comprehend, to comprehend vast quantities and characters of, uh, of, of information. And so um, you think about that $16 trillion economy, uh, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers, who did the study, they, 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 they go on to talk about the, uh, the estimated bump of GDP for China is on the order of, I think, 21 or 22 percent. And uh, the estimated bump in GDP for the United States is on the order of 9 percent. Uh, or it's actually a little bit more than that. It's, a, it's, a, it's like 14 percent. And then the bump in GDP for much, much of the modernized, you know, Western world is, you know, on the order of 9 percent. And so think about like the economic activity and the impact that that, that, that investment shift and that economic activity, uh, you know, uh, implies. It not only implies, uh, you know, significant changes in our warfighting competitiveness, but it really implies changing conditions for our economic competitiveness as well. 
So when I read about AI, I think about military competitiveness, yes. But I think about national competitiveness, economic competitiveness. This is, this is the environment that we live in and that we have to harness if we want to be effective in the military, uh, in the military space. Can you go to the next slide, please. So, so let me talk about the transformation of defense. And of course, that means like glistening robots, um, you know, on, the, on, 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 on floors with, you know, no dirt on them. Of course, that means, you know, glowing robot fingers touching human fingers or, you know, strange orange lights following infantrymen around, right? No, of course not, right? Like the, 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 the construction of a defense enterprise that can win in an AI competition doesn't look like any of this. Right? And so this is, a, this is a vision that Hollywood creates that, uh, that we just have to be really careful about, like really understanding the technology. What does this really actually mean? Um, robots might be uh, like that, might, uh, you know, m might be in our future, um, but we've got, a, we've got a lot of work to do to figure out the ethical baselines, the technology baselines, and the implementation for the capabilities that we have access to today. Next, please. So no robots. Next, please. Uh, here's, here's what I'd, I'd like you to think about. Um, let, me start on the, let me start on the left here. So, you know, around us in the, in, the, in, the, in the broader economy, I mean, we see the automation of everything, right? We are, we are you know, we've, we've experienced this for, you know, for several years. We're just getting started in the, in the economic activity that, uh, that is aligned with the automation of everything. And that is everything from, you know, getting a vehicle to drive you around to, uh, you know, ordering food to uh, paying your bills to, uh, you know, subscribing to things by getting, you know, retail delivered, um, you know, maintenance driven by AI, uh, you know, policy uh, driven by AI, industrial processes. Uh, you're driven by AI. So whether you're in the you know, retail industry, the, uh, you know, the information industry, the banking industry, the investing industry, uh, you know, any industry that, you know, that, that, uh, that thrives today is thriving because they took advantage of the information capabilities that they have at their fingertips. My favorite example by a wide margin is this one, right? So <laughs> you think about like things that AI can impact and you think about you know, wow, right, cutting edge things, right? Like, you know, like, like investing and, in, you know, shaving off, you know, milliseconds, you know, to, to get a trade in faster. I, here's the most powerful example that I can see. Like, like fundamentally, as, as a species, right? We were gatherers, we were hunters, and then we became farmers, right? So like core, like the core activities of our species now has been automated, right? So John Deere, it's too late to invest. Their stock price like exploded, like, you know, two years ago. Um, John Deere is an, you know, I always grew up with John Deere as a tractor company, right? John Deere is an AI company, right? And they have automated the business of farming, meaning you understand when to plant. You understand when to, uh, when to fertilize. You understand uh, when, to, uh, when to apply weed killer. I mean, to the degree that, you know, John Deere systems now, uh, you know, automated cabs and large, you know, farm equipment, but also, uh, they, have, they have detectors, right? So, like, so like when, the, you know, when, the, when, it, when the weeds start to sprout, John Deere uh, equipment can, uh, can travel over those rows and identify by looking at the, the little cameras, by identifying the, the, the leaves, it recognizes that's a weed or that's not a weed. And it will apply weed killer to the weed, and it won't apply weed killer to the, to the crop that you want to grow, right? Do you imagine, like, farming at scale, industrial scale farming, where you just have thousands of acres, and, uh, you know, you can't, you can't do that, right? So we've, we've fought weeds since we were, you know, gatherers, right, and farmers. And now automation is helping us do that in a way that's efficient. The, uh, the uh, you know, the effectiveness, the growth in economic output in, uh, you know, in farming, the efficiency and productivity is, is, like, through the roof because we've harnessed information technology in a way that we can apply to one of the oldest things that humans have ever done. Next, please. And so we, we, think, about, we think about this, um, you know, in a warfighting context, right? So, so like every warfighting function has, you know, think about military functions and, and you know, they're new, unique. Yes, of course they are. But you know what? Um, they, ha they rhyme a lot, right, with, with commercial functions. You know, when we, uh, you, you know, when, when a vendor or a, a company distributes uh, you know, products to a warehouse or to a series of warehouses so that those, those are close to where the market is or where they're going to be delivered, they use AI to do that. 
when we allocate uh, you know, resources across a battlefield or across a combat theater, you know, think about, uh, you know, hey, where are we going to need, wh where's our fuel today? Where are we going to need fuel tomorrow? And where are we going to need uh, fuel, you know, next month, right? And so, like, having data and autonomy and, you know, uh, decision support systems that help us predict and, and, and uh, become much more efficient and productive in our military activities is just as important as it is in the commercial sp uh, sphere. And, you, you know, you can see it across every joint capability area. Um, you know, if you, if you want a great mental exercise, right, just sit down with a list of joint capability areas and think about all the ways that artificial intelligence and information activity can accelerate those processes. And when you add those all up, the acceleration of capabilities in our joint force and in our commanders is, is, is uh, overwhelming, right? Um, and so, so we, you know, we really don't have an option. I mean, if we want to be competitive, we have to start helping, have to start letting machines help us, help us with our decision making, our predictions, and our ability to fight as a, as a joint force. And uh, you see, you know, you see on the, on the right here a bunch of, you know, every, everything from, you know, autonomous drones as a loyal wingman to, uh, you, you know, search, discovery, uh, even, you know, even, uh, even at the squad level, right? So, you know, what, is, what happens today, you know, when a squad's on patrol in, uh, you know, say, you know, say a couple years ago in Afghanistan, what happens when you come under fire, right? When your platoon is under fire, okay, Lieutenant, what are you gonna do now? You go to ground, right? And so you, 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 you mask yourself, you put yourself in defilade so that, so that you're not, you know, vulnerable to that direct fire, and then you immediately call for fire support, right? And that takes forever. Why does it take forever? Well, because we're not really sure what systems do we have, what, what's the ammunition status, uh, you know, what's the best way to action that target. Um, uh, Deconfliction, right, the longest, if any, you know, a targeting process. The, the longest part of a targeting process is deconfliction. We have to make sure that there's nobody else, you know, wearing, wearing our uniform that's in that space before we actually start releasing bombs, right, from aircraft or from artillery or whatever. And so, like, those processes, and the, uh, they suffer from a lack of situational awareness, the lack of ability to immediately understand what your options are and immediately make choices about how you want to support that, that, that platoon. And we pay for that, right, at the, at, the, at the platoon and the squad level and all the way up. This is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. How do you automate processes? If you can define a process, a military process, for like understanding the battle space, for example, then how can you use machines to provide the data, integrate the data, and, 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 uh, and, and make, you know, make that, uh, that whole process much more effective? And this is, this is exactly what we're talking about. Whether it's simulation, whether it's theater planning, whether it's war gaming based on uh, you know, predictive models based on past enemy activity, I mean, all of these things are like at our fingertips today. All of those things that I just described are in place to a degree but are ready to really break out and, uh, and expand across the force. Okay, if you go to the next one, please. Uh, I, I just threw a couple of examples in here just, uh, you know, so just uh, to, to ground this just a little bit. So this is a system that the Army is using today. They've used it, uh, I think most of, you, most of you probably heard of Project Convergence, which is the Army's annual like, large-scale integration uh, and experimentation exercise, right, where they take all the advanced tech that they're working with and they bring it together into, a, you know, into a, a, an operational environment. So in this case, uh, you know, with this system here, it uses a, a, you know, a, a drone swarm, nothing really uh, all that complex. But basically, uh, a, a squad leader or platoon commander on the ground can identify a battle space that, they, you know, that they're going to move into or they're interested in and immediately just assign the dr drones that, that area, and the drones will do a full reconnaissance. The drones will partner among themselves to figure out, okay, what's the most, you know, the optimal way for us to do this? How are we gonna partner? They communicate with each other, they cover the entire zone, and they report the, you know, the, what they see back to the, you know, back to the platoon command post or the company command post or, or whatever ha you have there. So, like, like, very simple, very straightforward, understanding the battle space around you, um, that's the state of the art, right, in the Army today for artificial intelligence. If you go to the next one, please. And it goes on, right? Obviously, the Navy and the, uh, and, and the Navy's use of unmanned systems is, uh, is much the same. So here we have uh, Seahawk and Sea Hunter uh, uh, down in San Diego. Um, really, really fantastic, uh, really fantastic capabilities going on right now with, uh, with the Navy, I mean, uh, both in the Middle East 
and in San Diego and doing, in doing really great experimentation for how do you augment your physical senses you know, as a force or as a ship? How do you augment your uh, ability to understand threats you know, before they are fully formed? How do you understand uh, you know, the logistics of, of naval deployments, for example? Um, all of that stuff is being worked by the Navy today. It's extraordinary. I, I got a back brief from uh, Task Force 59 maybe about a month ago, and, uh, and what Task Force 59 is doing out in the Middle East is, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Bahrain is working with a variety of international partners to demonstrate unmanned systems and the uh, capabilities that they might bring to bear. So that understanding kind of like how they work, how well they work, we can actually start to bring those into the inventory, right, and make those part of our warfighting culture and our warfighting capability. Uh, same thing on the, on, the, on the west coast of the United States. Um, I think it's under the auspices of Third Fleet, but the Project Overmatch um, uh, is you know, something that most of you may have heard of. It's a Navy project that really is doing extraordinary things to use artificial intelligence to optimize battle formations, to optimize communication, to optimize uh, their ability to fight as, a, you know, as an integrated force. Really exciting stuff. Next, please. Uh, here's a couple. This, this, is, uh, this, is, one, this is one of the uh, things that we did here in the, in the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. So this is, so computer vision is probably the most mature AI technology, you know, identifying objects in imagery or objects in pictures and that sort of thing. Um, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's kind of like where every AI engineer or data scientist cuts their teeth, right, as they're learning about this. You go to ImageNet, you know, you start looking at lots of pictures of dogs and cats and that sort of thing, so you can start to figure out, like, how do I actually use that data in, effect, in an effective way? What we did with, uh, with, with, uh, uh, with computer vision was tr build not just, a, you know, not just algorithms that can detect, uh, you know, based on, based on some level or some type of imagery, but we started to build a pipeline, right, so that now we have a factory for computer vision, you know, to build types of computer vision, whether you're working on IR or, uh, you know, uh, uh, electro-optic or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever frequency range or whatever, whatever phenomenology you're using plus whatever platforms you're using, right? Whether your image is taken from a camera, you know, at the, you know, you know at, the, at, the, at the CP entrance or at the gate or up in a tower or up in an airplane, um, each one of those, you know, have very, although the imagery is different, they have a very predictable pattern, right? And so the way to do that is, uh, is, is maturing very rapidly. And so that's pretty cool, um, but, it's, but it's, as soon as you take that first step into AI, and now you can start identifying objects and imagery, for example. Um, so in this example, okay, now you've identified a bunch of vehicles. Great. Well, who's in those vehicles? Where are they going next? Is that a threat? Is that not a threat? So you, you, you quickly, as, you know, as data helps you understand a piece of the situation, it immediately raises a whole other set of questions like, okay, well, wait a second, that's great, I know that now. Now what do I need to know? And what additional data do I need to know? And this is where you know, the, the evolution of artificial intelligence, really the sweet spot of that is not just, not just adoption of the technology, but the integration of the technology now by bringing in multiple feeds of intelligence, things that, uh, things that you may not have realized even that were relevant to, to your situation. And now bringing those things together in an in, in integrated way. We take narrow AI, we stack narrow AI, air, narrow, narrow AIs on top of each other, and we actually start now to get to integrated uh, situational awareness and integrated understanding of what's happening in the space around us. Next, please. And the last one, so this, this one, this is an autonomy project that we were working now. So, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, doing PED, right? Process, exploitation, and dissemination. Uh, especially the Air Force, so the Air Force is, uh, you know, is a leader here in this space. We, uh, we took an MQ-9 and uh, we, uh, we built a massive computer on the MQ-9. That's what's hanging off from that pod on the wing there. So that is the uh, Agile Condor pod. It is basically massive computing power. So that, that platform now, multiple sensor phenomenologies, can now uh, you know, observe its battle space through multiple spectra bring all that information on board the aircraft, can process all that information and identify the objects that are detected and then report those objects back to, uh, you know, back to the headquarters. So think about that. Instead of now having to like transmit all the video that you receive from the camera on your you know, UAV, that data is processed right on the platform and all you get is 
hey, there's an S-300 over there. Hey, there's a T-72 tank over there. Hey, there's another air defense system over here. That is the level of, of autonomy and, like, and, and uh, computer vision recognition augmented with, you know, synthetic aperture radar, infrared, so lots of different, you know, band with, or, you know, bands that we're operating in there, but starting to create knowledge of the battle space that then the humans can then start to understand, okay, hey, here's the environment I'm dealing with here. Here's how I have to respond to that environment. Um, we, we built this one specifically to be what we call as platform agile, which means um, we built the brain with the purpose of being able to move that brain from one platform to another, right? So this instantiation, it's integrated in, into, an, into an MQ-9, but what we're, what we're working with the Air Force on is how do we take the same technology now and integrate it into more advanced platforms, right? As uh, unmanned systems continue to mature, how do we make sure that they, uh, you know, they benefit from, the, you know, from the, uh, the, the capabilities that we're putting into today's platforms? Next, please. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here, uh, talk a little bit about, um, about uh, AI ethics. And I think the first, you know, the first piece of that, so understanding kind of like what I showed you is reasonably state of the art inside the Department of Defense. There are no killer robots in the basement of the Pentagon. Um, there's lots of robotic processes in the Pentagon, but they're, you know, they're not associated with robots. Um, so, so, but, so like this, this, is, this is kind of state of the art, where we're starting to take forays into the oper you know, what's possible, learning from commercial industry, finding similar examples, and saying, you know what, we could do that with our financial transactions in the Department of Defense, so we could be as productive as that accounting house. Or we could, you know, that, that, uh, that logistics application that helps, you know, Amazon run their warehousing, we could do the same thing and do that inside the, you know, inside the department so that we could gain the same sort of efficiencies and productivity that the world around us uh, uh, enjoys and benefits from. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, when I think through that lens, I think the taxpayers should have every expectation that the Department of Defense operates as productively and as efficiently as any other organization, right, as any other commercial organization. The only way that we'll come close to that is by the integration of modern information technology, the same technology that drives every operation outside the Pentagon. But it's not just about the technology, obviously, right? So, so the famous iceberg here where, um, you know, you see the applications. You know, I just showed you several applications. That's the part of the iceberg above the water, right? You know, isn't that cool? You can detect, you know, cats and dogs and imagery. That's really neat. Uh, but what really matters is, do you have the ecosystem now that provides you know, the data environment, the investment environment, the, the infrastructure environment, all the other components that make an ecosystem around artificial intelligence. And the most important thing there is your ethical environment. Like, do we actually have the right ethical understanding for how we understand AI, how we build AI, how we field AI, how we use AI? And this is, this is a critical component of the ecosystem that we're talking about here. So things like test and evaluation you know, become really important, right? How do we know, you know, what is our ethical responsibility? You know, I talked about comparatives. You know, we're gonna try to make that young platoon commander's uh, uh, mission easier to accomplish and make sure that, you know, he's, he's much more survivable with his Marines. Um, uh, but, but how are we gonna do that, right? Like, what, what do we owe that, that individual, right? We owe them systems that are going to work. We owe them systems that uh, you know, are, are unbiased or, or, or we understand you know, the, the biases that we've programmed into, in, into systems. We, you know, so we owe that understanding. We owe reliability. Um, there's, a, there's a strong ethic on the department and the, or, and the services, the agencies that, you know, f that, that, that generate AI. That AI ethical foundation has to be part of the construction process from the beginning. We take that part uh, uh, very, very seriously. Responsible AI is kind of our catchword. Uh, responsible AI, many of you are probably practitioners in that space. Um, this is something that means a lot to how we build AI inside the department. And I'll, I'll, let me elaborate just a little bit on what that means. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, let, let me, uh, so, so one, of the, one of the ways that, we're, uh, that we're, we're, we're trying to make the implementation of artificial intelligence better and more integrated inside the department uh, is we're, we're organizing some of the organizations that, that, that each have a little, little footprint in AI. We're trying to bring those together. So we're bringing together 
uh, the, the, the data, uh, you know, the data people, the, the chief data officers, for example, we're bringing together the CIO, like the chief information officers, the software organizations, things like the Defense Digital Service, the artificial intelligence organizations, things like the Jake, uh, the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, our analytics organization, our business analytics organization. Uh, it, uh, most of you maybe have heard the, the term Advana. Advana is the name of the system. That that, that that organization uses to run all the business analytics in the department. What we've done is pulled all of those organizations together into one organization called the CDAO uh, so that we can now start looking at this problem in a much more integrated way. We can leverage you know, uh, technological investments you know, in one function uh, for another function. We can now use those, you know, all of the, the collected expertise in analytics, in AI, in data, in platform, uh, platform construction, network, uh, network optimization, network security. We're bringing all those things into one organization so that we can, uh, so that we can work together as a team. And the first thing that we're doing is, uh, is, is something called ADA, the AI and Data Accelerator. And we're going to go, we're, 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 we're going to the combatant commands to help the combatant commanders understand their decision environments, their decision processes, and ways that we can help them optimize the way that they uh, do business in their theater. And so ADA is, uh, is, a, is a program whereby we're sending teams to each one of the combatant commands the geographic combatant commands and the functional combatant commands, and just helping them understand their data environment, helping them understand what's possible with automation, and helping them understand how they can use modern uh, information technology to include artificial intelligence and analytics to actually drive their processes much more effectively and efficiently. And so we're really excited about ADA, uh, not, be, not just because it's a cool name, because uh, Ada Lovelace is, you know, the, the at least this is supported or reported to be the world's first programmer. So Ada, uh, we carry Ada's legacy with us, you know, in this program. It's, or the, in this program, it's really exciting. So, so Ada is something that we've uh, we've kicked off. We're you know we're busy uh, we're busy working with the combatant commands now. Go to the next slide, please. And through Ada, uh, I won't read the list here, but this is this is what we want to accomplish at the combatant commands, right? Combatant commanders. Um, have, have the special joy of having all of the problems in their theater, but none of the resources really to, to handle those problems, right? So being a combatant commander or being on a combatant command staff is a real joy because you could spend all your time negotiating with the Navy or negotiating with the Army about, hey, I need a ship here. I need a, you know, I need a, a, a brigade over there. Hey, we're going to do something about this problem. You know, Marine Corps, can you help me? Like, this is the business of a, of a, of a combatant command, right, and in that environment. So if you're on that staff, um, you need data, you need process, you need visibility on what's available. And so we're helping the combatant commanders understand their data environment, help them uh, understand the processes they have, and then maybe improve those processes if those processes are inefficient, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the rest of the list. Next, please. And uh, extending that down to the operational level and the lines of effort. And next, please. And uh, I wanted to show this slide here. Now, now this, this is a little bit more complicated. So um, is, has anybody heard of JADC2, right? Joint All Domain Command and Control, right? And so Joint All Domain Command and Control, um, many believe that it is a program. It is not. It is a concept. And the concept is Joint All Domain Command and Control, meaning that you can use any sensor feed or any data stream from within inside the department or inside the joint force, use that data to inform other pieces of the joint force. So you can use uh, you know, data from an Air Force sensor to drive a Navy algorithm, right? Or you can use Army information about its position on the ground so that the Air Force can deconflict and avoid you know, uh, collateral damage or, or uh, you know, striking friendlies. Like this is, this is the, the vision of JADC2, is the networks, the processing power, the platforms, the sensors, and the data flows so that you can bring that all together into like a unified, integrated whole so you operate much more effectively. And so this is what we're doing through ADA. And uh, uh, I'll just show you, it's probably hard to see a little bit, but at the top you see the combatant commands. And so this is how this, is how this works, this is how the flow. Uh, when you're implementing artificial intelligence, you think about how do you scale, right? How do you achieve scale? 
we learned early on that just tossing a few algorithms out there, a computer vision algorithm that can you know, you know, detect dogs or cats, um, that's not really all that useful. You need the entire infrastructure to be able to drive your decision processes. So if you look at the combatant commands, those uh, two-digit or three-digit codes there, uh, you know, command and control, network-centric, force application, force protection logistics, force support, and battle space awareness. Uh, those are the joint capability areas defined in joint doctrine so that the, the, the Department of Defense builds capabilities you know, in those functions. So what we've done is gone to the command and commands and for the functional experts at the command and commands for each of those functions, we've helped them implement AI. We're in the middle of this, so we're just getting started really. So we're helping them understand their processes and then helping them automate their processes. And that's really cool because when you think about the ability to scale, you know, this first combatant command, the one, you know, the, the, the one that you can see, you know, if, if you build a command and control application so that that commander can start to, you know, command and control or understand, his, uh, you know, his or her battle space better, well, you know what? The combatant command next door has a very similar problem. So now you can take that same application, modify it, and apply it at another combatant command. And so you, and, and if you, you know, you can work through all of the combatant commands and achieve scale by taking one solution and then tailoring it for multiple command commands across multiple functional areas, right? So now you have a pathway to automate much of the work of the joint force. Um, when you have that, you know, you can scale jointly then, you wanna be able to do that at pace. If the US Department of Defense uh, uh, capability is going to be competitive with our opponents, um, then we have to be able to scale rapidly, right? We have to be able to build this quickly. So not only building, you know, and fielding sort of uh, demonstration algorithms now, but actually building the factory and the processes that allow us to do that. And that includes identifying data sources across the force. It includes, uh, you know, things like infrastructure, uh, data platforms where our data lives, uh, algorithm platforms or development platforms where you can actually code, you know, a, a, an AI application. Um, uh, infrastructure and operational platforms where we're you know, always watching what's happening in the battle space. This is the enterprise that we're seek to, seeking to construct. And when we, when we have the budding of that enterprise, then we will actually be able to compete effectively with the other enterprises that, you know, that, that, pose, that pose a challenge to us. Um, and at the same time, we will have built JADC2, right? We've, we've, we will have delivered this capability for any sensor to inform any decision maker or any, uh, or, or any shooter. Next, please. So now let me, let me turn, uh, I'll, I'll turn quickly here to, uh, you know, to the issue of trust. And I think this is probably what most of, most of us are, are really interested in. So in the backdrop of what's happen, happening technically, now let's think about how do we approach this from an ethical baseline. My, I, you know, my, my personal shorthand I've already told you, and that is legal imperatives, moral imperatives, and comparatives, right? But, uh, but obviously there's, there's more to our structure than that. And so most of you are probably familiar with the, uh, with the department's ethical principles. So those were uh, released under the previous Secretary of Defense and were validated again for the, uh, uh, you know, with, the, with the current administration, the current Secretary of Defense. And, uh, but, but all of those, all of those start to drive our, um, our application or, or our introduction of artificial intelligence into uh, increasingly more functional areas and then how we think about this as, as services and as capability owners. So the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, for example, you know, we, we build some AIs, but most of the AI is built in the services, right? So the service enterprises. So what we have done is teamed across the department so that we now have centers of AI, uh, ethical expertise at each one of the services. So we have, uh, you know, we have a responsible AI council, we have uh, uh, you know, policies and oversight and governance and the tools so that the services now can build a responsible AI ecosystem inside the service to ensure that, that, uh, that we're building uh, uh, AI that's consistent with our ethical principles that we've established there. Um, I, I get asked the question a lot about, hey, all this uh, uh, questions from Congress, from staffers, from others, hey, uh, you know, all this ethical stuff, isn't that a real drag on, uh, on uh, you know, our productivity? Doesn't that really slow us down because we are so scared, uh, you know, about making mistakes that we're not, you know, we're not on the forward edge? And, and like, you, you know, my jaw almost hits the floor, right? Because, because 
in actuality, practically and, in, in, and through experience, having a sound ethical baseline and all of the artifacts of that, not just ethical principles, but the trust and evaluation processes, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, acquisition processes, and, and the uh, human systems integration, for example. By building that environment, we actually, it, we actually accelerate the force's ability to, to build, test, and field artificial intelligence capabilities. It's a really exciting thing, and it comes down to trust. The word trust is critical here. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so I, I, on this slide, pay attention to the big bubbles on the top. Look, I, th I call this the journey to trust. So how do you get to a place where you can actually trust the AI that you're building? And I think the journey to trust looks like this. Um, you start off by the ethical principles, right? Responsible, equitable, traceable, governable, uh, reliable. Uh, you think about those, you know, you think about the ethical principles in their own right. Um, I think, you know, like, like for me, especially like governable, and reliable are like really important artifacts, right? Like, like those are, those, those are value-derived uh, principles, right? Because your, your obligation is not to just use, uh, you know, uh, AI reliably and, uh, and uh, ethically, uh, you know, on the battlefield, but your, your institutional obligation is really to the soldiers, sailors, Marines, guardians, uh, airmen who are going to be employing those systems, right, that are, that are run by artificial intelligence. They have to know that the systems that you're fielding to them meet all of those principles. They are reliable. They are governable. They are traceable with their decision making. They are um, a, 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 you know, observable and transparent in their processes. So starting with the eth ethical principles is a really important thing, and it really sets the framework. Once you have that framework set, test and evaluation becomes key. And I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we test and evaluate inside the Department of Defense. Once you start pulling the thread of how do you test and evaluate an AI capability, you really see how complex it is. And I, I'll, I'll show you that in just a second. But, uh, but, so, but, but once, you've, you know, once you've done your testing and you have a capability, then verification and validation become really important. And these are, these are two key steps in our ethical process or our test and evaluation process. So first of all, uh, 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 verification. Does the algorithm work as you've as you've built it, right? Does it actually work for, what, for the purpose that you've created it? And then verification, yes, if the machine works, does it actually accomplish the, pers the purpose that you want it to, right? So verifying that in the situation in which it is, is to be deployed, that you can actually uh, achieve the out outputs that you want. Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then human systems integration, right? So like if you have a working algorithm and it actually serves the function that you've established, uh, does it, does, do the humans that are going to interact with that uh, system actually, do they understand it? Do they understand the boundaries of it? Do they understand the limitations? I'll give you, the, you know, kind of a perfect example. So we had, uh, I showed you smart sensor, right? That, uh, you know, our, our automated MQ-9. Um, that, and we, we, we collected all kinds of data with that, and we, from that MQ-9 and then the whole fleet of MQ-9s. And, uh, and we trained a bunch of algorithms on that data, and it worked really well. I mean, you know, we had really good object detection capability and situational awareness that's derived from that. <clears throat> we took that platform and we flew it in Alaska. And guess what? Didn't work. Didn't work at all. Because the system had been trained on data that was derived largely from desert environments, and all of the, and so it learned very well how to pick out, you know, an S300 or a T72, uh, you know, in, in a desert environment. But when you brought it into a, a, a snowy environment, it didn't work, right? So, like, this is, this, this is, this is again, an ethically derived principle. I mean, you have to ensure that your humans understand the limitations and the boundaries of the practical application of AI technology. It's critical that you do that, and it's an ethical failing if you, if you don't think that through before you hand the keys over to, uh, to somebody to be actually employ that capability. When you, work your way through, when you work your way through those issues, and employment and employment doctrine is another, and I'll touch on that in just a second here, but, but when, you, when, you, when you think about like, like what we owe our operators, um, this journey to trust is what really helps me kind of be anchored on, you know, have we worked through all of these components? And this is really just beginning. Next, please. When I say just beginning, because um, it's, the journey to trust is really important. 
we want our operators, we want our commanders, we want the American people, we want uh, 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 the, you know, the, our, our, our coalition partners to understand and trust the capabilities that we're bringing to the battlefield. But trust isn't quite enough because uh, you know, people can trust things that maybe their trust is not justified, right? So it's, it's, it's important that you not only build trust, but you actually demonstrate that it works, right? You actually have to prove that it does what it, it does. And this is why a very rigorous test and evaluation environment is so important for artificial intelligence. All the services are wrestling with that. And I know you're gonna, you're gonna hear from or talk to some of the service reps uh, this afternoon. Um, all of them are working on like how do they build that trusted environment inside, you know, the test and evaluation inside the uh, department to not only make sure that operators are comfortable with it, but that they can actually be comfortable with it, right? It actually does deliver the capability that we wanted to. If you go to the next, please. And uh, so here, uh, here we, can talk, we can talk about test evaluation uh, process. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but, but basically, uh, but I, I, I love your questions on these, and I'll, I'll, I'll quiet down here in just a second. Um, but this, these are kind of the components to that test and evaluation process that serves to do the valid, validation and verification. And that is, you know, if you start up in the upper left, um, you know, does, you know, does the algorithm actually, is it, does it rest on sound data? Was that data, where was that data collected? Uh, is that representative of the, of the environment? Uh, was it, you know, was that data taken in low light or high light or in shadow or what kind of camera took those pictures, for example? Because it matters, right? If you train your algorithms on a, you know, with a certain, uh, 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 you know, f f photo, uh, uh, ba you know, color balance and that sort of thing, and then you employ it in a different, you know, with a different camera, for example, then you don't know that it will work, right? So, like, actually having all of that understood and proven on the front end. Then the integration of those capabilities into a system and a system architecture. Like, does it actually work now? Does it, what are the boundaries of, its, of, of, of it working effectively? If one component fails or one you know, decision element fails, does the entire machine collapse? Would an operator know if the system failed? All of that sort of systems integration testing uh, is, is, is brought into the, into the, uh, into the uh, equation. The, uh, does it actually work in the conditions that it's expected to work? Most of our military applications are very rigorous environments, right? Dirty, dusty, hot, wet, salt water. Um, so does our, do our systems work in that environment? And then finally, um, what about the humans, right? Can they trust it? Do they trust it? Have they been trained on it adequately so they know its strengths and its weaknesses? Um, do, does this uh, you know, impose a workload or a requirement you know, for a data scientist in every battalion when you don't have one, right, it's, et cetera. So like, how do you, how do you ensure that it fits into an eco, the human ecosystem that it's gonna operate? I'm gonna leave this slide up because, uh, because I, I suspect that we'll have some questions about this on uh, this particular slide. Um, so tell you what, I will, uh, I'm, I'm gonna just stop, I apologize for uh, transmitting, uh, holding the microphone down here for so long, but, uh, but that's why you asked me, right, Joe? So, so. Uh, I, I, hey, obviously I'm passionate about this, right? And I, and I see the necessity of this for our warfighting competitiveness. But I can also see, and I think you can, also, you can also see, the criticality, our obligation to our Marines and sailors and soldiers and airmen, guardians, um, we owe them equipment that works. We owe them systems that help them make good ethical decisions. And we owe them the training environment and the, and the uh, so that they know how to employ their systems ethically and, uh, and uh, you know, within the boundaries of which, it, which it's designed. Like this is, an, this is an institutional ethic that we carry as a Department of Defense and we carry it as individual services. So uh, to, to me, I mean, there's nothing more important in this conversation. Uh, the technology gets lots of attention and it's really exciting, it's very sparkly. But, but honestly, you know, for, for leaders in this space, uniformed leaders, not uniformed leaders, um, our obligation is pretty clear in this environment. So I'm gonna pause there and, uh, and I guess open up for questions if there, if there are any. I don't know, have you, have you assigned somebody to ask a question if nobody else does? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Sir. Uh, 
Um, it, well, it's, it starts with this, right? Like, do, do you actually have good data? Is that data, you know, can you actually use it effectively? Um, you know, d is that data robust? Like, how, um, you know, how wide can the parameters be before the algorithm starts to fail? You know, for example, we, we you know, keep track of, like, uh, uh, false positives and false negatives, right? Where, you know, false positive, where you said there was something there, speaking through a computer vision lens. Um, you know, false positive, where you said there was something there and there wasn't. Or false negative, where you, there was something there and you missed it, right? So there's a whole statistical science for, for how you actually evaluate the performance of an algorithm. That's, that is kind of like where most of us are inside the Department of Defense, using different data types, newer algorithms. Um, but we're starting to get into this space as well, which is like, okay, is it actually reliable? Is it secure, right? That like, like, where's your data? Is, is, your, is your data in a vulnerable network that you know, somebody might tamper with your data or put um, uh, you know, uh, uh, anomalous data into your training pipeline? Um, these, are, these are the kind of the complexity of the questions grow as you, as you work your way around the circle. Ma'am. Are you, you got the microphone, you might as well ask a question. <laughs> Sir. Yes, absolutely. So when you, th when you think about every warfighting function, I mean, that's a really important point. And you can see it like in spades, right, in, uh, you know, in the Ukraine conflict today, right? So, so one, you can see the hardware component of this. That is, um, you know, precision weapons and precision targeting information. What does that do to a massed armored force? So, you know, to your point, yeah, that, that warfighting case, we see every day. Fighting with precision, fighting with precision weapons, it's not massive firepower that matters so much anymore. It's the ability to hit the targets that you want to hit, right, and deliver, deliver that capability. But at the same time, look at what you see in the information environment, right? The information environment on the battlefield and information environment, you know, globally, where, where all the parties are trying to impact that. And so, like that, um, you know, being able to, you know, like do natural language processing like right at the tactical edge for, you know, hey, I'm, I'm listening to a Russian speaker. I don't speak Russian, but my algorithm does, right? And so like delivering a, tra you know, immediate translation of capabilities. So now you understand. Or translation, you know, of a, you know, now you're, now you're in Afghanistan. You need to, you know, you're trying to interact with a leader who speaks Pashto. Like, like that level of artificial intelligence integration to do natural language, trans, uh, you know, natural language translate, translation or processing, um, you can do that at a very tactical level. And then think about like now doing that at scale because you can do the same thing with like sentiment analysis, right? So if you read all the media coming out of Capital City, you can get a sense for, hey, are they angry at the Americans or are they not angry at the Americans? Are we there, you know, do they consider us friends? Do they not consider us friends? AI helps you do that, right? Because AI can work through those media streams and understand sentiment in, in context, right? In, 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 uh, in text. Artificial intelligence applied to support national defense. Like this is, like that doesn't sound particularly sexy, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Yes, almost all of this stuff is very straightforward applications of models to help you understand your environment better. Um, I, I still have, um, uh, one more point on your question, sir, and that is like uh, uh, SOCOM, for example, does, has lots of great work in artificial intelligence, a lot of it associated with sentiment analysis or working, you know, human to human. So all, you know, all of those, all of those uh, uh, components of a, of a force or a capability are covered. But, but, just, uh, but just working with, um, when you think, think through like the, the, all of the environments that can, you know, that can be accelerated and, and facilitated, the the comparative to me is just just overwhelming right because if we don't employ artificial intelligence in our processes we condemn the force to fight like those lancers 
right? And that, that's unacceptable. We have an ethical imperative there, too. Like, we, it, it might feel really good to send those Lancers on horseback, right? Because we don't want to change any ethic. We don't want to take risk in ethics. So, but, but that's what we have to control, right? That's, that's our obligation just as much as it is protecting individual servicemen or members uh, and, uh, and ensuring that we, you know, that we fight with the ethical foundations that are associated with the United States and our military capability, law of armed conflict, and all the rest. Sir? Yeah, Lit literally keeps me up at night, right? Here's the deal. I, I, I think in my mind, I articulate it um, like this. It is a contest between organization and innovation. The Chinese um, AI machine um, is, is, is exquisitely organized, right? They have complete civil military fusion all the data that comes from a very entrepreneurial culture. You know, that China has a massive and impressive artificial intelligence industry. They don't have anything like this, right? Uh, but, but they have mass, right? And so, so, like, they have tightly integrated anything that comes from that commercial industry is immediately hoovered up into the People's Liberation Army, right? And the, the experience with domestic surveillance, right? And you all have seen kind of, you know, the 60 minutes, you know, kind of, kind of videos where, you know, you see like, you know, somebody walking down the street and that person's identified, you know, with six parameters, you know, name, job, health status, you know, uh, speeding tickets, jaywalker, you know, like, like, like that, that, that power of building an enterprise that can operate at that scale is really compelling. So how do we win against that, right? Um, they have exquisite organization from, a, from, the, you know, from the Chinese Communist Party down to the streets of Shanghai to the People's Liberation Army. How do we win, right? We have to out-innovate them, and this is our strength. It always has been, and it is now. Um, as this technology matures, like the ability of our companies uh, you, you know, our tech companies and, and you know, the, the number of companies that are in this space is exploding, American companies and, uh, you know, and international. Um, so the innovation of our universities, um, you know, there's, there's, we work very closely with uh, you know, five or six like leading universities in the AI space. Um, we've got to figure out how does an innovative country and an innovative military and an innovative defense industry build the, become innovative enough to be, have just enough organization that we can beat a much less innovative but comprehensively organized uh, 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 architecture or organization. I, I worry about this uh, for, you know, for example, when you walk in the Pentagon, there's an Army floor, there's a Navy floor, there's a Marine Corps floor, there's Air Force floor, and the Guardians are, who knows, are on the roof or the basement or whatever. Uh, but, 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 you know, like, like okay, each, um, um, the Department of Defense is built uh, uh, to build domain-specific hardware, right? That's, that's the roots of our military culture, right? Domain-specific things. Well, they're airplanes. They're, you know, the Air Force does that, right? And they, you know, they kind of run that domain. And the Navy does ships and things that get wet. Um, the Marine Corps does a little both. Uh, you know, the Army does massive land things. Um, and so we bring that hardware culture into our department and our domain-specific culture into the department. But everything I just described requires, like, all of those lines that have to be removed, right? Like, if you're going to have an integrated AI-driven enterprise, then, you, then the Army has to be able to benefit from Navy data or you know, the Air Force data needs to be able to feed a uh, Space Force algorithm or a Space Force situational awareness. And so like building, you know, building the connecting files between all the services um, is really the holy grail here so that we actually 
fight and build like an innovative force right from the beginning, right? That has to become part of our culture. And the other half of that is not about building hardware, but about building software capabilities. More and more of our capabilities will become, have become software derived capabilities. And so our acquisition process is built for domain specific hardware. It takes years, you spend years writing a requirement um, and then you go try to build that requirement and it fails. Um, in a software environment, you don't build capabilities that way, right? You, you, you solve a little problem or a piece of a problem and then you keep building on that, on that front. So you start with, uh, with a problem and you work your way to solution. You don't define a solution and then figure out like, oh my God, how am I gonna get to that capability, right? So like the roots of our institutions are built on domain specific hardware. We have to, you know, we've gotta flip that whole thing upside down. The Department of Defense, um, needs to become the best software integration organization in the world. <laughs> Nobody laughed, right? Like, right? like, like no, no kidding. The Department of Defense needs to be the best software integrator in the world. How in the world are we gonna get that, right? If we're going to be competitive in this new environment, um, and we have to do it ethically, we have to take care of our people, we have to keep, take care of our, you know, our institutional ethics, but if we're gonna compete, we need to move a lot faster, and I don't think anybody's surprised by that. Way in the back, sir. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, when we've uh, failed in technologies uh, across DOD before and in the services, uh, we've often backed into leader development. Yeah. Uh, and in the case when you're talking about the human machine integration, yeah. we often look at that and test that against the operator level. I was wondering on your thoughts on how we develop leaders to stay ahead of the complex technologies and mission threads uh, that they'll be guiding. So, um, the answer, let me, let me, I'll take, I'll take the, I'll, the bad news first, maybe. So, like, um, senior people in the department, like me, um, you didn't necessarily grow up, you know, understanding this technology and really understanding the transformational differences that we have to make. And so, um, I hear a lot from my peers, you know, I talk a lot about AI, of course, in the department with, you know, service chiefs and vice chiefs and that sort of thing. I hear a lot of uh, it. Um, well, what will it do, you know? Is, is, is it going to tell me, you know, solve my problems? Is it going to, and I keep telling them, you guys, stop thinking about it as it, right? It is an extension of you, right? It is your decision process. How do you wanna, what data do you wanna bring into your decision process? Would you like to know? I, I ask commanders all the time, you know, who, who, who struggle with understanding like the, the the shift, the mental shift that has to occur if you're gonna really adopt this transformation. I ask them all the time, like, okay, Commander, um, you, you've got a decision to make. What, what's the one thing you wish you knew before you made that decision, right? If you could have one thing um, you know, that would help you make that decision, what would that be? Oh, well, I'd, you know, I'd wanna know my, uh, my logistics status. Okay, great. That's data. Let's go find, is your, where's your logistics status? Oh, it's here, here, and here. Let's take those numbers, combining them, and display that to you. Now you know your logistics status. Can you make a better, better decision? Yeah, I can. But you know, I'd also like um, you know, my operational status, right? Like I'd like to know, like, you know the status of my units and who's ready to fight right now and who's not. Great, so let's go get the data associated with readiness of, of your formation and pull that data together. So now, Commander, now you've got your logistics status, you've got your, your blue status, you understand your force better and your ability to sustain an operation. Um, what else would you like to know? Well, I'd like to know where the enemy is. Okay, great. So let's take that intelligence track and we're gonna integrate that into your decision process. And so now, artificial intelligence is giving you your logistics status your blue force status, your red force status. Now can you make better decisions? Well, I, yeah, that's awesome. So the AI isn't going to make a decision for you. It's not a magic eight ball, right, that you know, comes up and says maybe or whatever. You, know, you, you guys don't know what I'm talking about, but you guys do. Um, um, but, uh, so, so that's not it, right? The model is how do you bring data into your decision process, right? And that's, that's really key for teaching seniors how to think about artificial intelligence, because it really is a different way to think. The good news is with you guys, right? Because, I mean, you know, most of you guys are digital natives. Um, uh, look, look, this, this is not a, like a passing fad, right? This is a fundamental change that has occurred across our, our, uh, our, all of our economic sectors. 
it's going to, it's going to come to pass too. I guess for leaders in the department, our decision is, do we want to take this challenge on now and, and fix the problem now and lean into this turn? Or do we say, well, gee, I don't really understand this ethics, so I'm just going to leave it to these people to solve the problem you know, in their turn. They will. You guys are digital natives. You know this space. You're taking classes on cybersecurity. You're taking classes on ethics. Um, you guys, you, know, you future leaders, young leaders, future leaders, you're going to come into this space. You'll fix it if it's not already fixed. I'm very confident of that. But I think the mandate, you know, again, another ethical requirement on the leadership in the forces today, all the services, certainly, we have to start leading the way. We have to start changing the culture so that the department understands how to, how to turn into this, you know, into this wind and really succeed as a force and become competitive as a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a department. So, are you the hook? <laughs> all right. Well, well hey, thank, thank you all very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, have the conversation with you. Sure. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, great. Thank Fantastic. you. Perfect. Spot on. Now, what, what powerful image that is to start with this uh, photograph taken in 1913 of French Lancers, yeah. uh, just a year removed from an immersion in total mechanized warfare, right? They were so cool. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and thinking about it, you mentioned uh, in, the, in your closing remarks about the midshipmen are here. They're in a, in a similar situation in that they're a year removed from uh, a new type of warfare, a, a warfare yeah. that we're watching in real time now. And I particularly love that you said uh, we're operating at the speed of software upgrades as opposed to the traditional systems. Because I think most of us have watched over the course of the past month plus as our, our uh, partnership, you might say, with SpaceX has enabled them to provide uh, internet service yeah. to Ukraine yeah. in the middle of the fight. And as the Russians try to take that down, um, they make a simple software upgrade yeah, exactly. and they keep uh, the internet turned on for the entire country. And that we are dialed in with this level of detail uh, to partnerships like that, absolutely fascinating. So what you've just done is help guarantee that we don't have Lancers here, but somebody that's prepared to take the baton on this new AI awesome. ecosystem. And for that, we're really deeply grateful. So General Grone, awesome. thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Really appreciate it.